come to her because uh, he has an immense amount of stuff here in front of him, and I hope he, well, he, he <coughs> does it justice and gets through it tonight because um, it does, does actually say an enormous amount of stuff. And this is quite dear to my heart because my grandfather was in World War I and I have his medals there, which um, Jared has on display. Um, Jared tells me that he's the secretary and you're a member of the Glass Nevin Genealogical Group. Genealogy Group, okay. And, uh, <coughs> Excuse me. I'm not so sure whether you've ever spoken here before, have you? No. Okay, so for a first time, um, would you please welcome Jared White. Well, Jared, this, or is that too dark? Or no, is that's it? fine. Okay. Thank okay. you. Good evening, and I'm delighted to be here to give you this talk. It's, in a way, it's a tutorial, because um, I grew up in Bray. My grandfather died in 41. I'm a 53 baby, so I never got to know my grandfather. We had a writing bureau in the drawing room, and in the writing bureau there was his World War I medals, his roiled up and fusilier swagger stick, and a little brooch from Arras in northern France and uh, a photographs of him in military uniform. Again, as children, we assumed, and it's dangerous to make assumptions in this game, but we assumed that uh, he fought in the First World War with the Royal Dublin Fusiliers. Uh, many years later, when, I, when we managed to get the, the records, and I used them through Ancestry, I got a big surprise. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to take you through his records, my uncle's records, and then my grand aunt's two husbands, their records. And then we'll have a few others that are going to come into play because their records give us, um, uh, what, what I call it, guidance on how we should go about searching records and pitfalls that we can fall into. So I've just set, always set out a timeline and at the end of my slides you'll find a tip or a hint or something that's you know useful to know. So I just have a very basic timeline there just to show you that a timeline is important when you're going to set out your, um, your study or your research into somebody who was, who was in the First World War. <clears throat> at the end of the First World War, there was six to seven million soldiers' records, of, but that's other ranks, that's privates up to sergeants and non-commissioned officers who served in the British Army in the First World War. And all these records were stored in the War Office in London. In 1940, during the Blitz, this store, uh, war office store, was, was hit, and 60% of the records were destroyed. Some commentators will actually say 70%, but I think the consensus is somewhere around 60. This, these records have a, sorry, these records have a, have a war office, WO is war office, so all these records that are, that were, re that were what we call it, salvaged, from the thing, or have got this number 363, and they're known as the burned records. So there's 40% of the service records were destroyed. So immediately, your chances of finding a service record are greatly diminished. There's also records that were um, service records after 1920 for soldiers are not available to public access. I do have a leaflet here, both from the American uh, Record Office and from the British Record Office, showing you how and what the procedure you must go through if you want to view those records. So I, I, it's there for, for viewing afterwards if anybody has anybody who served after 1920. The unburned documents are on WO, three, six, four. And again, uh, these are soldiers who either who uh, left before 1920 
and you'll always you'll know by the um, <coughs> the archives reference there which set of documents they're coming from. The household cavalry and the guards regiments. I'm getting conflicting information with regard to the to the guards or to the household cavalry to the availability. So my suggestion is that you check online and look to the National <coughs> Archives UK for guidance notes with regard to their availability. This is, this is the, what information is contained in the W1 service records. So you have your basic information here, and then you, you can have these forms attached to the uh, service file, but not necessarily all of those documents. Again, this is my caveat, beware, warning. I've seen people spend a couple of hundred euros searching for World War records and all as they got was a metal card that they could have purchased for three sterling fifty from the National Archives. When you go into the National Archives to get the document, they're overprinted with a uh, watermark. My suggestion is that you pick out the cards, they're on a, they're on a sheet of, of six, pick out the one that you need, but actually blow it up on the screen of your computer. And then, sometimes you'll actually be able to print this, and you won't have to spend a 350 on it. <laughs> but, again, make sure that you're getting the right one. Fires seem to follow genealogists around. The American army, so if you have Irish ancestors who served in the US Army in World War I, they had a massive fire in 1973 in their record stores. And 80% of the personnel who were discharged between November 1912 and January 60, and other files not relating to the period of World War I were destroyed. There was no duplicates, but again, you have something here to fall back on. And I have details here with me tonight of all the records that are still available to you, like rosters and other documents where you can build up a picture of the service. What information, if you're going to look for a, ser <coughs> for a service record? It's great to know the, the name of the soldier, the Christian name, and sometimes the service records only bear an initial, the military rank, the service number, and the mm -hmm. regiment. But as we'll see with one of the, my subjects tonight, he's going to have three serial numbers because he was in three different groups or regiments. And again, my thing here, my, my tip here is of two. Last, Nove last November, I met the grandson of William O'Toole, who served in the First World War. And he said to me, my father is 82, my uncle is 89. We've been told that there is no military records for him. He told my father and my uncle that he served in Egypt during the First World War. So I said to him, Give, send me all the details you have and I'll have a quick look for you. Of course, when I don't know a family, I'm going back to basics and you'll see on my shopping list or my checklist in a few moments, they're in red. The, you're looking for the census records, the birth registers and the uh, death registers. But the name on his service card is Tool, not O'Toole. And yes, he was in Egypt on the, in, in 1919, and um, he was delighted to find, and he has a whole set of records. But the nice thing about it was that he kept writing to the British Army looking for a good service record. And of course, they kept writing back to him saying, we gave you one in 1919, we should have taken better care of it. <laughs> so... But you can see the O starting to creep in in his correspondence with the army 
But of course, they're only referring to him by his serial number. So it doesn't matter if he put the O in in the correspondence, but all the correspondence going back to him is without the O. So I found his military records, and there they are. I dropped them into uh, the grandson, and uh, he called a meeting that afternoon of the father, who's 82, as I said, and the uncle, to break the good news to them that they weren't O tools, they were actually tools. <coughs> But again, they never knew about her grandfather. His grandfather being O'Toole, uh, was not O'Toole. He put the O back in after the, after the First World War. This is my shopping list, as I call it. So it's your medal cards, your service records, the silver badge. These were soldiers who were injured, came home. And of course, people were given the white feather. And the British Army then issued these medals or this badge to demonstrate that they had seen service and that's why they were they were walking the streets at home in, in Dublin or London. Uh, family oral history, uh, personal papers, and we, we'll see examples of that. Prisoner of war records, soldiers' wills, that's the National, uh, the Irish National, Ar uh, the Irish National Archives. British Army pension records. If the soldier got a house or a cottage under the Land Trust. Patrick Short got one up in Old Court Park in Bray. So there's something else that people fail to follow through on when they're looking at World War I records. And then these are my go-to. If, if I haven't done this already and somebody comes to me looking for information on their, their ancestor who fought in World War I, immediately you go back into the red here because you have to prove who you're looking at. Newspapers, roads of honour, <coughs> maps, trench maps. The London Gazette is great for tracking officers and awards. And then the Common War Graves Commission for soldiers mm -hmm. who didn't return. Local war memorials. You have them in churches, you have them in towns. Memorial cards, lots of families did memorial cards. Death notices in the paper. You have the medals, and, and we have here Tony brought along his grandfather's medals to, to, to me tonight just to let us see what they, what they look like. We'll go into uh, have a look at medals later. Photographs in uniform, they tell us a lot because they, they have the insignia, they have the regiment, can be distinguished from that, and also rank. Uh, correspondence, some of them sent home letters. Are they still within the family? Regimental uh, histories, unit histories, ship histories. Before you go looking at World War <coughs> records, you need to get the abbreviations. The documents from the simplest medal card right through to the service records are actually riddled with abbreviations. And unless you know the abbreviations, you're not getting the best out of those documents. So I have about uh, 80 pages of abbreviations that I have discovered over the years. And it's, it's a, a great little gold mine for looking for a thing. A guide to the medals. So it's, if somebody comes to you with, with a medal and says, this is my grandfather's medal, can you, tell, can you find his record for me? Again, you need to know what medals you're looking at. We'll see those later on. Photographs of headstone or memorial panels. Not every soldier who was lost in World War I got a gravestone. Many were, were, were lost forever, and they're only on memorial panels in the massive graveyards that dot. In, in my grandfather's case, where he served, the, the whole of northern France. Uh, sea charts. Again, we're on to the sailors. The Navy's pink list for ships in service. If anybody has any... Uh, relation who served in the Battle of Jutland, there's a free site which has the listing of everybody who served on every ship that was in the Grand Fleet, both Jellico and Beatty's fleet. The Army Register affects what the, how, what the widow was owed, um, the, the settlement with the widow, I think, uh, for a soldier who was deceased. And remember, use the snipping tool. It's your best friend on the computer. 
because sometimes things will be published or, or on screen, but you can't save them. Nothing stopping the snipping tool, but I have to carry the uh, warning about copyright. Again, now we're going to look at Patrick Short, my grandfather, Patrick Short Jr., my uncle, and John Cleary and Arthur Cleary, who are who married my granddad. So we we'll start off with Patrick Short. You can see there he was in the Royal Dublin Fusiliers. He was in the Royal Irish Regiment, uh, the First Labour Company, and he was in the 182nd Labour Corps Company. Patrick Short was a stoker, and he only served on the Chester. He was also on Pembroke, but that was the training base. Um, John Cleary, he served in D Company, 9th Battalion, the Royal Dublin Fusiliers. And Arthur Cleary joined the Navy in 1901 and served until 1919. Now, he served on 14 ships and shore bases. That took some digging out. So what I would do is I would create a timeline for the service of the, of the service personnel that you're, in, that you're researching. Patrick Short. Remember we said he was in three different uh, army groupings. Royal Dublin Fusiliers, the uh, Royal Irish Regiment, and the Labour Corps, and his two medals, the Victory Medal and the British War Medal. And again, we can see here, he's wearing the cap badge of the Royal Dublin Fusiliers. And here's his baton stick with a uh, with the end here, which is uh, an enamel crest of the Royal Dublin Fusiliers. I have that. So, search for a photograph if possible. Patrick Short. This is the front of his medal card. So we can see here there's no mention of the, the, uh, the Royal Dublin Fusiliers because overseas service was all that was recorded on your medal card. The other thing too is that medal cards do not contain a date of birth. So you have to do this detective work first to make sure that you have the right medal card for Patrick Short. And we'll see an example later on with John Cleary how many <coughs> other people have the same serial number. 90 have that serial number in the British Army. <laughs> so this number is important too because this is where you see this number here. These are the two medals. He got the victory medal. But this page here is the medal roll. So you'll know when you get to the right medal roll page because you're looking for this number here. So let's just have a look at Patrick. He was 47 when he joined up. He was born in 1868 in June. He was 50 when he was discharged and he was 72 when he died in 41. So again, no date of birth and only overseas record or service is, is acknowledged on the medal card. Always check the back of your medal cards because if you buy them directly from the National Archives, you only get the you only get the front of the card. You have to buy them. You have to get them through Ancestry if you want to see the back of the card. Again, his card has nothing on the back of it. But if we take his commanding officer, Captain McCormack, Andrew McCormack, he was in the uh, Scottish Regiment first. But we can see here that he was, uh, there's, no, there's no number. So uh, officers didn't have numbers. Again here, he was a solicitor from Newton Stewart in Scotland. Again, a great piece of information there. So always look to the back of your medal card. So check the back, uh, no serial number for officers, and see the red star above. This is Captain McCormack here in his court robes here. This is Patrick Short, my grandfather here. So that's my message from, from that slide there. Moving on, this is your medal roll. Again, here we are here, our 6630. So we know we're on the right medal card. Now here we have all the soldiers who served in the 182nd Company of the Labour Corps. So what I'm doing at the moment is I'm putting together the 600 
who served in the, in the Labour Corps. And I'm able to work out from this their previous regiments. And I remember a lot of people in the, in the Labour Corps came into it because they were over 35, they were, um, some of them were injured and they were sent there to convalesce, but they weren't ill enough to send them back, repatriate them back to the UK or to Ireland. So they kept them locally, looked after them, and then each month they had a medical where, and the standard of that medical reduced as the war went on because they were so anxious to get the people back into their, into their own regiments. So what I've discovered in, there's numbers missing. And I found this one here the other day, number 44. So it's uh, 109044. He's a Scot. And he was from a Scottish regiment. And it looks like that he went back to his own regiment. And that's why that line is blank. I've, I've started looking at this. But again, I'm finding these blank numbers or missing numbers on the page. So at this, I'm able to build up here all the soldiers who were in the, uh, in the 182nd Labour Company. Depending on how this is made up, if it's made up from a mixture of things, you're going to find it very difficult. But again, thank God, this here, I'm able to use it to define all the, the private so, uh, sergeants and non-commissioned officers who serve <coughs> the 182nd Labour Company. Now, this is your, um, this is your, this, what they call the casualty form. Um, Ancestry has uh, I've put this into their files, but they're calling it the part of the service file the record. To me, it's all with his discharge papers, but that's a, a matter for another day. Again, get your list of abbreviations because you're going to make the best use of this document. You're going to need your abbreviations. Now, what I suggest you do is you get your document like this and give a good margin each side. And then write out here a description of what you're finding. So when you look at this, it's on the same sheet of paper. You're not going to another sheet of paper to look at back at this. What's this mean? You have an arrow going in there. I know that that's the number for the, uh, for the 182nd Labour Company. I can see here, there's his number. The first time you come across his number for the 5th Battalion of the Royal Dublin Fusiliers. You can see here that it is struck out. But if you look here very carefully, you can see there, and you've got to, sometimes it's great to put them up on a big screen. And I have a big, uh, a 24 inch big screen behind my uh, laptop. I can throw the document up there and then analyze it in detail. I can see here that he, he arrived in France in this, on the 12th of February, 1917. He was transferred into the Labour Corps the Labour Corps came into existence under this army order in 1917. I can see the, sh that the field leave that he got, and then he was, <coughs> he was disbanded in Poor, uh, Poorfleet, south of London, in uh, 1919. But I also see here there's an address for his next of kin wife, 13 Aberdeen Square, Bray, County Wicklow. So, I see here the day he joined, and I can see here that he was in the first, uh, first um, the Royal Irish uh, Regiment's first Labour Company. So I'm picking up a lot of details. I can see his rank there. I can see his Labour Corps number here. So you're picking up a lot of information from this sheet. So my advice is give a margin each side and then put out your data describing what you're finding internally in the document. Service record. Class Z is the reserve. They put everybody into the reserve practically in when they came, when they were discharged in 1919. Remember, they only had an armistice. We didn't have the peace treaty of Versailles until 1919. And the biggest fear was 
that the German forces wouldn't lie down and that they would rise up again. So they put everybody into the reserves, so at least they had them organised, they could recall them at short notice if they were required. So always check, see what the reserve status is. Again, you won't know that unless you know what your abbreviations mean. Again, we can see here that he spent one year, 358 days. And this is only overseas service. This is not time that he spent in Ireland or in a holding area in the UK. It's only your medal cards and your documents. It's only reflecting your overseas service. <coughs> again, <coughs> check for home address. And again, we see it here his home address, so we know we still have the, we're on the right document. Again, this is his uh, statement uh, as to disability. And again, we have here 50. That's the nearest they've got to his correct age. Mm -hmm. And again, this is the dispersal unit in Poor Fleet, uh, south of London. Here, the age last birthday. He was never 43 years of age within the service of the British Army. Again, these are things that you've got to watch. So check, check the date of birth back with the birth cert. See the red star. So if you were to look at that document, you think you might have the uh, you know, that was an Easter document or a document given to you. You think, oh, that couldn't be him because he was born in 1868. So that's the document in full, and I've blown it, I've, take, I've got my snipping tool out, and I've taken this bit here, and that's that top section there for you. Again, I've taken this section here, this is the top set of the bottom section there. He's saying that in 1918, he got influenza, he has myalgia, he has lumbago, and uh, he's just shattered by the sounds of this. And he, he's a, the exposure was on uh, active service here. Again, this is that document that we were just looking at. That's what the whole document down looks like. Some of the documents are in very poor condition. Uh, I have one here. And you can see the damage that was done to the documents. Mm -hmm. So, And then there's documents within the National Archives in the UK where... All is missing. We have the centre of the document, but the top part where the name is, is gone. So they don't know who that document belongs to. But again, the service history is there, but we don't know who it's belonged to. This is the, uh, uh, what would you call it? This is a, a return that was done every Saturday by the officer commanding the unit. And it's just like a, an inventory of what he had at his disposal. But how many men he had, how many animals he had, what sort of transport, what sort of guns he had. And then how many active members of the unit he had. And then that was against the base. So this is, this is something I found in, in, a, in one of the documents. But again, it gives you a very good example of what sort of documents were being filled in. And many of these have been destroyed, but I actually found this one. So I, I said to myself, well, that's a useful information to have because it shows you what they were looking for, what information was he sending back to his headquarters so then they could ascertain what additional supplies or additional manpower was needed in that particular unit. I managed to find... Uh, the, the documents of his uh, commanding officer, Captain McCormack, private papers. It was uh, one of my uh, happier moments in all of this in the Imperial War Museum in London. And I have looked at this and I can see here, I've adopted, by adopted the dog, and that featured in a publication later on, which I have in his file. He took a tour of some mines. The mines we'll see later on, and tunnels, 
were some tunnels under Arras. The gas attack, again, one of the, uh, the soldiers later on was a victim of a, a gas attack. And then he's, he describes in great detail his uh, relationships with the, with the locals, with the Chinese, huge amount of Chinese labour force, and also, um, I have here the London Gazette. Now, here's where I can track Captain McCormick's, uh, Lieutenant then Captain McCormick's career through the, and I have his medal card. But also, as well as, he names places within, so I was able to plot those on a map of northern France. And I'll show you later on how I managed to get more information on where he was. There's the piece we said about the, the dog. And uh, I managed to, I wrote to the Lieutenant Colonel retired of the, uh, the Logistics Corps. And he sent me the diary for the 182nd, of the 198th Company. And lo and behold, all that yellow highlight on that relates to the 182nd Company. So every time they bumped into the 182nd Company or the other company, they gave them a mention. So from that, I was then able to plot on maps of northern France exactly where they were on particular days and what tasks they were undertaking whether it was unloading trucks, unloading trains, burying bodies. I have, a, but if you were overlaid a map of the Commonwealth Graves Commission's sites of their grave uh, yards, Patrick Short <coughs> was in each one of them. Again, this is, uh, this is John Sterling's uh, book no, no, no labor, no battle. So it looked, when you're doing this, look to see, is there a war diary available? It may not be the 180 seconds war diary, but it could be a group diary or a headquarter diary, but you may find reference to the unit or the regiment that you're looking for. And then it lends you then that you can plot the locations where your ancestor was on a map of France or ever what uh, theatre of war they were in. Again, photographs. If you can find photographs from that particular battle, that particular engagement, they'll add interest to your subject matter. Again, these soldiers here are members of the Labour Corps in Arras, where, where, where um, Patrick Short was, was stationed. The blue line is the British line. The red line here is the German front line. Arras was built on the geology underneath Arras is uh, limestone, chalk. So if you go into Captain McCormack's thing, he mentions the New Zealanders. The New Zealand Tunneling Company constructed all these tunnels here and gave them names from, from New Zealand, like Christchurch, um, Auckland, Wellington. And these trenches were capable, these tunnels and subways were capable of holding 20,000 men, keeping them out of harm's way. And again, they're coming right up here against the German front line here. And you can see here, there's the Auckland, Wellington, Christchurch, Nelson, Dunedin. And again, here is another set of tunnels but these are being constructed by British tunnelers. But Captain McCormack, in his, in, his, in his memoirs, got a tour, conducted a tour of that set of tunnels there. So maps will add great um, interest to your, to, your, um, to your research. And again, we can relate these tunnels here back to Cormac, uh, Captain McCormack's papers. Again, these are massive... Um, naval guns that were on um, railway wagons because they couldn't run them on the trenches, they couldn't pull them with mules, so they ran railway lines in 
and these these guns could fire anything up to 10 or 12 miles so you were always patrick short even though he wasn't actually fighting on the on the front line they were there was 200 and 2300 of them killed through unexploded shells illness and of course this long range bombing that they <coughs> were subjected to from these uh, naval guns on railway wagons so we're going to leave the western front now and head out into the north sea and here's patrick short crest of the the um, um, the chester he in the royal navy uniform and his two world war one medals again he was only on he was only in pembroke which was the uh, training depot he it, it, there's a mention of chatham there as well and he was dis he was discharged in March of 1919, and he only served on the Chester. So let's find out a little bit about the Chester. The Chester was laid down in 1914. It was being built for the Greek Navy, and it was completed in 1916. Battle of Jutland was at the end of May, the first of June of 1916. So they had very little time to get acclimatized to their new ship. So we can see where it was built, and it's, it was eventually sold for scrap, and we'll see why it was sold for scrap in 1921. So, ships and sailors, great, they have a service history. Ships are finding it more interesting now than soldiers, since I got into this, because they're in a defined space, and you can actually follow that ship around through the Navy lists, where it was on a particular station at a particular time. Then this is the record of Patrick Short in a little more. So he was only five foot four and three quarters. And he, was, he joined up for the hostilities and he joined in February of 16. We can see here that he came up and he was, came up a, a, through the ranks as a stoker. He seemed to have a very, very good record here. And again, he was discharged in 1919. Again, problem here, date of birth is incorrect on the record. So highlight anything like that you see, highlight it because if you're doing this for somebody and they go back and say, well, sure, you didn't spot that his date of birth was wrong in these military records. So just be aware of that. Again, here's the Chester. <coughs> 29 men were killed on the Chester, and we'll see why in a minute. And one of them, a young 16-year-old, got the Victoria Cross. So there's the ship, uh, the Chester. Back to Jutland from the 30th of May. Some, some have the 31st of May, but they actually set sail on the 30th. And it was finished in a day. So this is the Chester. This is one of the guns from the Chester here that uh, young John Cornwall was uh, uh, stationed at. Here is uh, Jellicoe's fleet, and here's Beatty's fleet, and here's the German fleet making a break. They're trying to get out because they were being blockaded in here and here by the British Navy. So. Chester is part of this fleet. Here's the German fleet. Sorry, it's not in colour. And this is the British fleet here. And the Chester is part of that squadron there. Now, in 1923, they did a 700 page report on the Battle of Jutland. Minute by minute, practically. And this is here, the Chester being sent back to port. They lost two capital ships very quickly in the, in the Battle of Jutland. And here's the Chester. I'd say that's offside somehow. Here's the British fleet, here's the German fleet, and here's the poor old Chester. No wonder it got hammered. So, this type of research will add interest to your readers. And again, definitely the Chester was offside. Very lucky to escape. There's the Chester when it arrived back into Hull. You can see there, it was very lucky because it didn't get hit below the waterline. 
it lost some of the superstructure here and you can see there four of the uh, shell holes in, in the thing. This is Jack Cornwall here who got the DC and you can see here that the ship was in a sorry state. There's the, the stokers working on the uh, firing up the engines. So try and see can you find another event connected with the ship or the battle. It will add interest to your um, Patrick Short. We try and find out what happened to the service person after the after the First World War. So in 1920s, in after that, he joined the Royal Fleet Auxiliary. He was on petrol tankers uh, following the fleet around. And in 1927, he joined the Irish Lights. He was on the Alexandra, and then in 1928, he was appointed to the Asalda. On the 19th of December 1940. The assault was attacked off the coast of off the Salty Islands in Wexford. It was going out to do a relief of the barrels and the Conningbeg lighthouse. They had put the crew onto the barrels and they were proceeding to the Conningbeg with the with the Christmas relief crew when they were attacked three times by a Condor bomber here. This is just a painting that's down in the National Maritime Museum in Dunleary. Patrick Short. This is a letter from one of the officers and he says here, I saw poor Short lying dead and naked on the deck. Uh, Rushby Hayden and Holland, um, they, they went as well because uh, they were in a boat uh, in one of the tenders and it was blown to pieces. So six of them, all from the Dunleary area, were killed on uh, that. I'm actually doing Next year is the 80th, and next December, December 20th, is the 80th anniversary of the sinking of the Asalda. And I'm doing a piece of work which I've started there on the Asalda. So I'm getting military intelligence files and the lookout posts on the coast and Lloyd registries and all sorts of things I'm adding, getting together. So that's going to be, I hope, a nice piece of work in the making. And I'm very pleased with the progress that that's making. So again, it's great to find out if you can. So we move on to John Cleary. John Cleary joined up in 1915, and he was killed in the First World War. He was only less than a, uh, less than a year, uh, year in the army. Again, go to your Common War Graves Commission website. It's free. And that's where I would make my first port of call when you know a soldier was killed in the First World War. Here's his medal card, and we can see that he was killed in action on the 27th of April, 1916. There's his number, his serial number, and you can get that for 350 sterling from the National Archives. Again, I explained to you that, how you can get round the watermark there is 30 others, there are 29 others in the British Army with the same Syrian number as John Cleary. <coughs> so if you're going in to look for somebody by Syrian number, try and do it by name first because you're going to get bombarded with all these. If we go for, Pat if we go for Patrick, his father, there's 90 in the British Army with the Syrian number 339. Again, our next port of call will be the National Archives in Ireland because they hold the soldiers' wills. And we can see here that they are holding one for John Cleary, date of death. So always check in the National Archives for a soldier's will. This is the form that was, that was filled in uh, when they were drawing down. And here's the will written out in his own hand. And this is his, the only photograph I, I can identify of Elizabeth Coe, uh, my grandmother's sister, uh, that was taken from the group photograph at my parents' wedding in 1952. Again, here is the, the soldier's effect. So in other words, here's what Elizabeth Coe 
uh, Elizabeth Cleary Nico was getting from the British Army. Again, it says here the 8th Battalion. At one stage, the 8th Battalion and the 9th Battalion were sort of amalgamated because of the, they were decimated and they just joined them up. Again, I remember I said to you, where is another port of call? Is the graveyards or the local war memorial? If you go down the Quinsford Road in Bray, near, down near the Dart Station, the back of the Carlisle grounds is, is over the wall there. There is the war memorial, both to the First World War and the Second World War, and we can see John Cleary is on the war memorial. And again, he was gassed on the 27th of April 1916, and he's on that honour roll there. Again, if you're doing something for a family, it's nice to be able to do the, um, if you're doing it for them, do it um, with that page from the, from the uh, Common War Graves Commission's uh, website. It's a nice lead page in if you're putting together something for them. And again, it's nice to show them where the graveyard is. And you can see here that he was William Cleary and Margaret Cleary and their address. And then his wife was in Bowden Cottage on the, on the seafront in Bray, down near the boathouse, uh, the Bray head end of the seafront. Again, this is the cemetery that he's, he's remembered. He's not on the grave. He's on the, one of the memorial panels on the side. And here he is in the Roll of Honour. And here he is. This is a listing of that particular Roll of Honour, a transcription of it. And there he is there on the Roll of Honour. Now we should look at Arthur Cleary, his brother, so Arthur joined the British Navy in 1901, and he served until 1919. When he served, the British Navy was operating ships that were both sail and um, uh, steam part. Oh, sorry, gone a bit fast there. Again, what are we spotting here? The British Navy record has the wrong date of birth. I used his church record here, but I, I know it's the same on his civil record. But I just, just to show you that you can use your civil record, you can use your civil records and your church records. For some reason, if you can't get a civil record and you do have a, a baptismal, at least you have some sort of uh, proof. So here, 1882 is the year, and here we have 1884, and he joined as a boy sailor. Now. Uh, I'm not sure whether this was, you know, trying to get in as a boy sailor, but again, uh, the jury is out on that one. Again, here, it looks like he went to Dardanelles, so I'm still trying to find out, I still have to find out which one of the ships that he served on served in the Dardanelles. This is his record. And again, it's made up of 14 ships and, and shore stations. It looks like that he was a trainer at the shore stations. But again, I've spotted something here. And I'll show you what it is. And I thought it was an error here, an error in the transcription. But I went back to here. Here is January, 11th of January 14. And the next entry here is the 27th of January 15. So... Where was he for that year? Is it an error back on the original document? That's, an, that's something that probably we'll never know. But again, always get a chance. If you get a chance to look at the original document, take it, because transcripts can be wrong. Again, here is one of the ships that he served on between 1911 and 1913. In, in 1914, they brought a lot of these ships in, and they call them hulks, and they used them as accommodation blocks and training uh, classrooms in the various ports like Devonport, Portsmouth, Chatham. These ships were used, and you can see the stern of another one here. But again, they, would have, they wouldn't stand up against the German high fleet at all. 
the safest place for them was in here as accommodation blocks. So he has 14 ships and shore bases. Takes a lot. It takes a lot of uh, researching, and I think Eddie, you've 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 uh, done a bit of work on that as well. You were telling me earlier about trying to find the various ships and get photographs of them and things like that. So it just takes a bit of time. Again, here's here's um, uh, my sister-in-law's husband's family. I he gave me a loan of this to take a photograph. This is a. Bernard Carberry. He was a corporal. He was in the 8th Battalion of the Royal Dublin Fusiliers and he was killed in action in 1917 in Belgium. His body was not recovered, but he's on the Tynecott Memorial in Belgium. <coughs> the family of a deceased soldier got one of these plaques in this uh, peculiar shaped um, hard cardboard envelope. They were known as the Dead Man's Penny, and then they got this nice letter. From the, uh, on the instructions of the king. Um, again, that's something that somebody may come to you and say, look, I have this, at least you have the name on it, and you can go researching from there. Uh, one of the members in uh, our group came to me and said to me that they ha she had James Cash, and he died on the 7th of November, 18. Thursday, and according to the Irish Memorial Record, it states that he was killed in France. Yet he was buried in Dean's Grange Cemetery. And at night, this part of the war, they were not repatriating soldiers back, deceased soldiers back. So I said to her, Look, we'll go and we look at the internment date in Dean's Grange. And lo and behold, the internment date in Dean's Grange was the 11th of November. Now, undertakers, even locally here, would have, would have great difficulty in, in making that uh, jump for a funeral. Don't mind bringing it from France through England, then on the ferry to Dublin, and then out to Dean's Grange for Monday morning. I doubt it. So, my, my advice here is that if you see a soldier who is deceased in Ireland, look for a GRO death certificate. And in this case, I found one. He died in the military hospital in, in Formoy, which is now an Aldi superstore, <laughs> not in France. And the cause of death was influenza. His brother, whose headstone is right beside him, who was discharged earlier from the British Army, also died of influenza. And the two headstones are side by side in Dean's Grange. If somebody comes to you with medals, you've got to be able to distinguish what type of medals they are. So get yourself a photograph of the various medals. This is only a sample of the, the medals that were issued. There is loads of more medals, and you'll see <coughs> in my uh, record here of um, where I keep uh, my documentation, I have a picture of every medal that was issued in that conflict, so I can identify the particular medal. And again, thanks to Tony tonight, his, he brought along his grandfather's medals. And if you're looking at it, on the middle edge of the medal, you'll find who they were issued to. And in the case of the star, it's written, on, it's, it's engraved on the back. So that's a useful point, a starting point, if somebody hands you a set of medals and says, I'm looking for you to research my grandfather's records. Then there's the the 14 star and the 15 star. These are the, the common ones, but there is other uh, awards that were issued as well. These are some of the recruitment posters that were uh, in circulation uh, to encourage the Irish men to join up. Again, the Military Service Act never came into force in Ireland. That came in, in that was conscription. And that increased, that's one of the reasons why they had to engage the Labour Corps. Because they had all these soldiers over 35 who are not A1, who are not capable of going over the top. And they had to do something with them. So they had them in all these uh, groups 
uh, work groups within the, uh, the depots, but they had to sort of organize them because they were, it was totally disjointed. And the Labour Corps, which later became the Logistics Corps, was the answer to that. <coughs> and I think, as John Starling says, uh, no Labour, no battle. Again, these are two other posters that were circulating at the time. This is my, uh, what would we call it, uh, sum of, uh, there's another slide to come as well, and it's some of the sites that are available. Some of them you pay for, you have to do a subscription. Some of them are free. And um, you have the, the, you know, the, the ones that we all know about, Ancestry Find My Past, Gold Tree, the National Archives, um, Forces, uh, War Records, uh, the National Archives Free, uh, Imperial War Museum, I had to pay for Captain McCormack's papers, I think it was about 70, it was paid, I had to pay per page, and I had to pay for the postage, it was 3.9 kilos of paper. <laughs> The first one came and it was damaged and was torn. So I just sent an email back and I said, the, pa the pages were all double numbered. And I said to them, how do I know what pages I'm missing? And five days later, one came in bulletproof wrapping. <laughs> and uh, so I now have two copies of the <laughs> of his papers. Um, again, there's a great site there for the Jutland crew lists if you have somebody in the Navy. See my time is I'm nearly there. And again, the long trail is a very good. Some of these are very good. Um, uh, what do we call it? Sites where you can go on, uh, put your problem or put your uh, brick wall, and people will come and give you a help. So some of them are very well. Again, if you're looking for the admiralty pink lists and that, there's many books and, and websites on the First World War. This is only a tiny sample that I pulled out in preparation for this uh, presentation. Again, remember your old snipping tool. Can't be your best friend. Now, have you backed up your research? USB key, external drive, or you gone onto the cloud? Are you, are you, have you got a paper copy? Your photographs, have you scanned those? Have you, have you got the, the parents or the grandparents to tell you who's in them at this stage? I'm sorry, we didn't. Mm -hmm. I think we all regret. So there's something that's a, a, a little task in its own right. And then, if you develop a history like this, what are you going to do with it? Is it going in the skip when you pass on, or what's going to happen? Is it worth thinking of leaving it to the society or to a, a local library, or one of the uh, if you have manuscripts and things like that? Is it the National Library or the National Archives? Again, that's your. Have you backed up your research? Thank you very much, and not forgetting the sailors among us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for that and I love